Can you hear me now? No audio. Is it working? Yes, no, working, thumbs up, all good. Okay, yes, we changed the mic and uh, didn't change the setup. See, um, I was just saying, technology is great, but uh, when you have a glitch. So here we are, <laughs> welcome to another Digital Photo Mentor Live. Great place on the internet to learn how to edit your photos and have some fun while we're doing it. So <laughs> technology, technology. I'm Darlene with Digital Photo Mentor from uh, digitalphotomentor.com and today I'm going to be editing reader and subscriber images. If you've followed along before, you'll see that um, there's lots of tips that will be included today, including editing with Lightroom and Luminar, uh, both as a stand-in and a plug-in for Lightroom. And today I may even be using some Photoshop because I've got an interesting image to show you with a watermark. So you can submit your own photos if you're new to this channel and to this live. There's a form down below in the video description where you can submit your images. And if your images are selected or one of your images are selected, I might be editing them next week. So without further ado, let me just get started with a little intro. And let's take a look in the chat and see where everybody's at. Okay, so we know we've got Nigel who joins us from the Barbados and he's had some uh, ash issues there due to the volcanic eruption. Um, Holly um, from New Jersey and from Vancouver and has been on many tours with us. So today I want to, uh, we had requests last week to do some uh, people images and Richard sent me some as well as Holly did so I can only edit the kinds of images that people send and uh, So far we've had a lot of landscapes. So today we're going to do focus a little bit more on some people images um, Hey Pete from Belgium's here. <laughs> nice to see you Pete. I uh, don't know if you missed the big beginning But we had some technical issues, but we are here now. So um if you are using uh, Lightroom as your editor, you'll be able to follow along with a lot of the tips that I'm using here. If you're using Luminar, you can do the same thing. Whatever software you guys are using, you can get this, the tips to apply to that software. So it may look slightly differently or it might be uh, that the um, tools name something different, but you can take the techniques that I'm using and apply it to whatever software that you are using. My tools of choice are Lightroom and Luminar AI. So I'm going to switch over here. Let me just get out of this. I'm going to switch over to Luminar and let me just find Holly's image. Okay, here we go. Screen share. Uh, why is that not showing the full screen? Okay, that's something's gone wrong here because I'm not seeing the full screen. Do you guys see the whole image? Uh, let me try this one. No, that's not working either. Okay, hang on a second. We just need to do a slight adjustment. I uh, will be right back with fixing this. No idea why this got resized, but my video feed has been resized. So we're fixing that on the go here. All right. So I'm not on the screen right now, but you should be able to see Holly's image. Oh, sorry guys. This is, uh, <laughs> This is not what I was planning on today. All right, we're going to go with my head not on the screen. Can you guys see Holly's image now? You should be able to see the full image. No, it wasn't um it wasn't a resizing the window screen Pete. It's inside of OBS. It's inside of the uh the video streaming software. It got resized the window. Okay, so here we, here we go. Um, this is an image that Holly submitted because we uh, said we wanted some people images and she was uh, generous enough to send me some that we can use. I believe this is her beautiful daughter. So I wanted to show you, this is the before image. Okay, so this is the image as it came out of the camera. 
and that was my edit that I just did right before we went live and it took me about three minutes to do that okay so I'm going to show you how I did this and I'm also going to show you a few other images because I had another one submitted by Barb and she was having trouble with the sky replacement okay so this is the original image and she was having trouble with the sky replacement going over the church steeple so I'm going to show you this is the one that she created and I'm going to show you how I actually didn't replace the sky but I enhanced it instead okay sorry can't see the bottom of the screen okay all right I've got a note over here that people are having trouble seeing the bottom of the screen so I have to fix that um, I think I know what I did is I'm not using the right screen resolution for video today yeah one of those days okay let's see is that better now you should be able to see the bottom of the screen and let's see if we go back here. Can you see the screen? All of it now. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening, you guys. For some reason, it's just not. Are really letting me resize anything? Can you see the image now? Yeah, now my screen is like that. Ay, ay, ay. One more try. Okay. Now we should be full screen. Okay. full screen yeah I don't know why it's cutting off the side <sighs> how's that yeah I don't know what's going on today this is not my day obviously it's cutting off the bottom too <sighs> okay <laughs> yes, go get a coffee, please. Uh, okay, I think we're good there. All right, so let me try this again. So this is the image that Barb had tried to do the sky replacement on, and she was having trouble up here with the sky replacement going over top of the church. And that's partly because when you're trying to replace a sky that has clouds in it, like her original one, which looks like like this it's very hard for the program to distinguish the difference between the sky and the clouds and the church steeple which is a very similar tone okay so what I did instead was I just enhanced the sky that was there because it's actually really quite good so I wouldn't do a sky replacement on this image okay so uh, my screen share is not perfect but I'm gonna get this up and running here so that I can show you guys oops that I can show you guys what's happening here. Uh, let's see. All right, that should give you the full screen, I'm hoping. Yes, uh, okay. Yep, changed a few settings today and everything went haywire. So always test when you go and do these things. All right, so I'm gonna go back to Holly's image and show you how I went from this beginning image to the finished edit that you see here. Okay. I'm inside of Luminar and the reason that I'm inside of Luminar is that there's a lot of portrait editing tools in Luminar that you don't have in Lightroom. Now I can do the same edit in Lightroom but it would actually take me longer because I have to do things with the paintbrush, the adjustment brush, a radio filter, lots of things where I'm moving stuff around and doing it manually versus inside of Luminar there's a lot of stuff that's automated okay so a couple of things that I did I did a little bit of a crop on this one just to get rid of this there was a couple of hot spots at the top of the image and I got just cropped in a tiny little bit to get rid of that right okay? 
And inside of Luminar, if you're new to Luminar or just starting to use it, anything that's been applied to one of these tools, you'll see a little dot next to. Okay, so you can see that I've applied something in the light area. So I've dialed down the highlights and added a little bit of blacks. Okay, when you have no black in your image, the image tends to look a little bit flat. Okay, so when I dial down the blacks, and I'm just going to turn my clipping warnings on here. Okay, so when you turn the clipping warning on, what that's showing is the histogram is showing here, and anything that's showing with these blue highlights, and I did that with J on the keyboard, okay, that means that those areas are clipping black with no detail, okay. I don't want to go that far with the blacks, but when you add a little bit of black, see how sort of flat the image looks, it doesn't have a lot of contrast, and when I add in the blacks, it just richens the, the deepness of the shadows, and it increases the contrast and actually saturation as well. Okay, so it really punches that up. Um, I'm actually going to warm her up a little bit as well with the temperature slider. Okay, she's a little on the blue side, let's give her a little bit of a tan. And I've also used the Smart Contrast Slider. Okay, so Smart Contrast is something inside of Luminar that increases or decreases the contrast, but does it obviously in a smart way, okay? So that's what I've done inside of the light panel. Inside of Structure, now this is a really cool one because there's a tool that's coming soon, they've told us probably summer this year, for Luminar AI called Boca AI, where you can actually automatically add some Boca to your background, okay? So that's that nice creamy blurry background or out of focus background. And what I've done here is I've kind of simulated it. Okay, so when I turn this tool off, you can see that I'm looking at particularly, look at the background, okay? When I turn it back on, I've added a little bit of softness. And I'll just take it farther so you can see what it's doing. Actually, that's really nice, okay? So I've added some softness to the background with this tool because I've dialed in minus structure and then I've masked it using the masking tool so that it's only applying to the outer bits of the image and down the bottom, but not on her face. And if I wanted to get it off of her um, sleeves and her arms a little bit more, I could just erase the parts here so I'm not blurring so much there, okay? Like so. So wherever you see red um, on the mask, that's where that filter is applying. And I got that to show up using the forward slash key. Okay. Um, something else that was applied was a little bit of landscape enhancing. And I'm going to dial this one a little bit to the left. And what this is doing is just picking up those colors in the background. Okay, so it's giving it more of a golden hue overall. If we take the golden hour up, okay, you can see that it's adding a whole bunch of gold in this. Okay, so. I like that one just to pick up the foliage a little bit and then I've applied a vignette and the cool thing about the vignette in Luminar is that you can place it where you want it okay so you'd have to do this with a radial filter if you're using Lightroom okay so I'm just dialing the feather of the a vignette all the way to zero and then that allows you to adjust the shape using the roundness slider I want to keep it fairly oval the size and the position, okay? So I've dialed it down really dark and feathered to zero so I can see the outline, and then I've placed it using choose subject. See how I can move the vignette around? So I want it basically centered on her, like so, okay? Like that. Then I'm just gonna double click feather and put the amount back up to something a little more gentle. You don't want your vignettes to look like this, okay, you don't want your vignette to look like that so it's obvious. You want a strong feather, okay, so feather means that the edge is softer and you want the amount to be a little bit more subtle. So you want the eye to be drawn into the middle of the picture with not, with, without saying, oh, there's a vignette on this picture, okay, so see how soft it is, but it's really drawing it into her face. Then I've used the portrait tools, so sliding down here, we've got Face AI. Okay, so Face Light is a brilliant slider that actually picks up 
the face because it's analyzing where the facial features are. See, it's lighting up. It's like you put a reflector on her face, okay? So what I'll often do is turn this up and then turn the brightness of the overall picture down. But you see how that helps to add to that vignette and bring her face really out of the scene, okay? Slim face, I don't want to do on this one because she doesn't need that, but you can see what it does. It sort of squishes the face together. And then I've applied some IAI to brighten the eyes. And I'm gonna turn this face off. So let me just zoom in here. Whoa, that's a little too much zooming. Let's go 50%. So I'm gonna turn off the face AI just so that you can see what this tool is doing, okay? So see how it's brightening her eyes, brightening her face. Look at the irises, okay? If I wanted to change the color of her eyes, I could as well. Oh, she's kind of got hazel eyes. That's a little bit too far, <laughs> okay? So you wanna try to match, if you're doing a color change, the color of their original eyes. Uh, let's even try gray, okay? So we can brighten her eyes that way. I'm gonna stick with the original because she's got beautiful eye color and lots of light in her eyes as well because Holly did a great job here with lighting, okay? Down under here, we've done a little bit of lip darkening. Um, there's a couple of videos I did on using these tools in the um, our Luminar AI playlist. If Rob, if you wanna pop that in, there's three videos that I've done um, using this tool to show each of the pieces using the face light, the eyes, and the mouth. Under the next tool down, I applied the skin softening and the shine removal as well as skin defects. So let me turn this one off and you can see what it's doing. Give it a second to catch up. Okay, so what this tool does is it does soften the skin, but it still keeps, look at, you can see her pores still, okay? So I've taken it all the way up. Let's take it all the way up to 100. A lot of these sort of automated programs do um, make plastic skin, and I don't like that look, okay? So this one I really like because you can use it automated. You can create this as a preset or a look, okay? and save it and apply it on some other images, okay? So I'm gonna show you how I've done that. Uh, so let's say I'm gonna save this, okay? So let's take a final look at the before and after just to make sure I'm happy with it. And I think my vignette's a little bit too dark, so I'm gonna scale that back a little bit more. That's better. And I also applied a glow here, which is Orton Effect, okay? So Orton Effect is a great um, sort of a softening. And this one, let's see if I've masked it. I think I've applied it. Aha, so I used the preset. I used a look to apply this and it's applied it in the wrong place. So I wanna make sure that I clear this, okay? And then apply it all over. There we go, okay. So if you use a look like I did here, always check the mask because if you apply a mask on something and then you save it, it's going to apply that same mask in the, the same place on the next picture if you do a copy and paste. And now my cat is walking across my desk. Hi Munch. Okay, so, oh, let's see, let's see what Glow is doing. Okay, so here's what Glow is doing. So it's just giving an overall softness and that's that Orton effect, which I really like. Okay, so I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna show you how to apply this to another image. You can save this as a template, okay? So I'm gonna save it, because it started. I started with one called Family Photos. Then I'm gonna go back into my templates, because that's where I would have saved it. And you can see there, there it is at the top. And I can now rename it, okay? So I'm just gonna call it Holly's Portrait. Okay, so now I know that this is a single portrait and she's got another one, which is more full length. Okay, so I want to apply that same template on this image, okay? And let's see how it's gonna work. And just click it. All right, pretty good, right? And that's one click. Okay, so now remember I applied some masking on the first one. So let's go and take a look under edit, right? I know that the ones that I masked was structure, so I can check the masking on this one. Okay, so this one I might actually wanna mask even a little bit more, especially in that background, okay? So I'm just going to paint in the mask into these background areas around her, 
in here to soften it a bit more. Okay, so I want to make sure that she's sharp. And the thing you want to be careful of is that like the ground around her would be sharp as well. Okay, so you don't want to sharpen the ground where she's standing and have her um, sharp and the ground blurry. So I'm actually going to make sure that I've got this part of the ground nice and sharp here. Okay, so we mask that one. Let's check the vignette positioning. Okay, so feather to zero, amount down, and now we can reposition this one because she's over here. Maybe down a little bit more. And this one I might want to reposition, the, resize it as well. And then adjust my amount and my feather. Okay, so you see how kind of I go through those various steps to adjust it. And I might do a little crop on this one. When you hit this Composition AI purple button, Luminar will give you a suggested crop, but it doesn't always give it the right positioning because what I'm looking for is to get rid of this part at the top here that's bright. And if all I, all I have to do is reposition the crop that it's suggesting, and I actually agree with exactly what it's chosen. Okay? So very quickly, we went from this to this. So it's punched up the contrast, but really featured her. And because of those facial AI tools, it's going to recognize her, once it comes into focus here, it's going to recognize her and apply those same things, even though she's in a different position, okay? So see how that's applying on her? Brilliant, right? Now let's say I want to apply that same one because I've got a couple other portraits that came in from Richard. Right? Let's see if I want to apply the same one. There's another way to do that. Let me just go back here. You can actually copy and paste the settings as well. Okay, so we can do right click, adjustments, copy, and that's command C as well. And then go to Richard's photo and do Command V, or I can right click and do the same thing. <clears throat> you can see it's processing. Wait for it. Okay, so we've gone a little too far on the glow with Richard, so I'm going to dial back the glow or possibly even turn it off. Generally, with a, a man's portrait, you don't want to have so much softening. Um, and it's a little bit on the dark side, so I'm just going to brighten him up a little bit. Okay. But it's done a fairly good job, and I think that structure is probably in the wrong place as well. So we'll check the mask on this guy. Yeah, so he's being softened a great deal. So I just want to make sure that he's not being softened, just the background. Okay. So in this case, the copy and paste didn't work as well because I had him in a different position. And let's just see, I wanna make sure that the wall next to him isn't quite as, as blurry either because it would be sharp also, okay? So you wanna make sure that things look fairly realistic. That's better, okay. So now we've got the background is being sharpened and he's not. Okay, so the color is being punched up, the contrast is being punched up, everything is sort of being blurred in the background, and we have a much nicer, pleasing portrait. Okay, he's a little bit on the blue side, so I might warm him up a little bit. Now there's a couple things we can do. We can drag the temperature and tint sliders, okay, and those will apply in Lightroom as well. Or something inside of Luminar under the color panel is remove color cast. Okay, so often I'll just try this one and see how it does. So it thinks that there's some blue and it's definitely removing that. And then I'll just go back and brighten him up a little bit more. We could also go and do face light. Okay, it's because it's his face that really is dark. So we could do a bit more face light and brighten him up. Okay. Let's try copy and paste again. So we're gonna do copy. And we're gonna go back to another image that he sent. I believe this is of his lovely wife. And let's do a copy and paste onto this one. Because they're in a similar position, it should work better this time, okay? So let's see what happens when it comes in and pastes that. Okay, now she's a bit yellow, okay? So we made him more blue, more yellow because he was blue. 
And obviously the color on her, we didn't need to have that much yellow. So we'll just dial that back a little bit. But right out of the gate, that copy and paste worked pretty well. Okay. So some of the things that are distracting about this image and why I want to do that is because the background is quite busy. Right? So if you can blur things out in the background or minimize them if, they're, if there's lots of highlights on them like I did on the trees, then the subject is going to stand out more. Okay? So the whys around why am I doing these things is to get the subject to stand out. And what I'm seeing now is this little um, railing in the background really stands out. I mean, ideally, this is not the the best sort of scene to take her photo. And when you're shooting, you want to be uh, conscious of these things as well. So you can only do so much with editing. And at, the, at some point, it becomes, okay, I should go back and take another photo. You also want to watch for, like, her fingertips here are cut off. So make sure that you don't cut off fingers, toes. Um, the general rule of thumb with people is don't cut at the joints and don't cut like wrists and ankles in particular okay because it looks like like the fingers are just amputated so be very careful of that okay let me come back over here uh, i'm gonna come over here and see if i can see you guys all right so <laughs> let me try and fix some of my technical stuff is there any questions while i'm i'm mucking around here rob so i'm gonna try and fix my um technical snafus here Take your time on the first one. Yeah, copy and paste. And Orton effect is very cool indeed. Yes, you did do a good job on that portrait, Holly. The, the lighting is really great on it. Yeah, really great. Any other questions? No, I still can't get my screen to work on this one, so I'm just going to keep going with this. So we'll have to fix it for next week. All right. Going back to screen share. Um, okay, so we've done a few uh, people pictures. I want to go and do this one that Barb sent. Okay, so again, the issue that she was having was that the sky replacement was going over top of the steeple. So what I did instead was I just enhanced the sky that was there. So let me show you how I did that. And I actually even added the birds in. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to undo everything. And that's the history panel. And I'm just going back to the original. Okay. So you can see that I corrected some, some tilting as well. Okay. So that was done with the composition tool. There's a little tilt here. Um, I just grabbed this one and I'm looking at the building. So I'm looking at the verticals and I'm just kind of eyeballing it where I think that it looks more straight about like that. Okay. I might have come up a bit from the bottom as well. So if you want to, um, when you're cropping, if you're just cropping for yourself or sharing on the internet, don't worry so much about aspect ratio because I find there's a lot of sort of foreground here. And I do like the, the water on the rocks, so I want to keep that. But I don't need these rocks down in the bottom here, so I'm just going to get rid of those. Right? Just hit enter to apply it. So now we've just straightened the image. The first thing I'm going to start with this is this Enhance AI. So if you're new to Luminar, start here or start with the template. Okay, so I believe I started with the template, um, which was Backlit Clouds, but this one does a really nice job. So look what it's doing, and I might even leave this one all the way up to 100, because right out of the gate, it's really doing a nice job on the sky, but punching up the contrast overall. Okay? The sky enhancer only applies things to the sky. So it's kind of like um, if you are applying a polarizing filter and darkening the sky, and it's doing a really nice job there also. Okay? So just with a quick composition adjustment and those two sliders, we've already gotten something more dramatic. So part of the thing is choosing when to do a sky replacement, and I wouldn't do one on this image because you've got a sky that's already interesting enough. Right? So I would do something like that, and then I think I just added a little edge vignette. Right? Now if you want to darken an area that is not on the edges, okay, so the vignette, let's just go a little darker here. Okay, so the vignette goes from the edges, okay? So even if I make it smaller, um, change the shape of it, when I'm moving it around, it's always 
you know, got this sort of oval, right? So it's always darkening the edges. If I want to darken something that's in the middle, I'll show you how to do that. All right, so we're gonna do a little edge darkening there. To darken parts that are in the middle. So let's say I wanna darken this white wall here. You can use the dodge and burn tool, which is down at the bottom under professional tools. Okay, so there's lighten, darken, and erase. So darken is what I want to do, and I always turn my strength down to about 10, okay? And I want to paint little by little. So I'm just going to start painting here on this building because I want it to sort of minimize this white wall. It's just too bright. And I might even want to minimize this yellow wall because I want attention on the church and even on this person on the bench here. Okay, so I can darken the sidewalk a little bit. And you can see that it's coming very slowly and I'm doing that on purpose because I don't want to do like one swatch at a time because then it becomes really obvious where you've painted, right? I might even want to just do a swatch through this sky to see if I can darken the sky area a little bit that's bright. Okay, uh, it looks like it's not doing a lot, but let me turn this tool off. Okay, see what that's doing? Because I built it up slowly, it's not obvious, and that's the idea that you want to use with the dodge and burn tool. Go slow, okay? Super contrast is another one that is effective for uh, if I want a tone control. So highlight contrast. I want to try and see if I can get some more out of this sky here. And if I go this way, it darkens to the right. This way, it lightens. But you can see there's really not much detail in that sky, so I'm not going to do that one too much. But let's try what happens if we do mid-tone contrast. Okay, so now we're getting more drama, right? Punching it up a bit more in the sky, and then dial it back. So I put it up to the middle, see what it does, right? Play with these bottom sliders. This one, if I go to the left, it's brightening the shadows, darkening the shadows. So if I want more contrast or less, I kind of want a bit more, but not that much, right? Let's see what this tool is doing. Okay, so it's very subtle, but it's just punching up things a little bit more. Let's take it up a little higher. So it's just taking an image that was overall flat to begin with because of the overcast day, right? So lighting is very flat, there's not a lot of contrast, and just adding a bit more punch. Now when you add that contrast in the blacks that I mentioned earlier, look at the color saturation in the sky, in the yellow, the red roof, and the green trees. Okay? The colors really punch out as you increase that contrast in the blacks. Okay? So that's what I would do with that one, Barb. Now I think I'm going to hop back over into Lightroom. All right, can you guys see my Lightroom now? Because we had an image that was, I uh, just want to make sure you guys can still see the screen. Okay, so I'm adjusting so you can see it. Okay, there we go. All right, any questions? Okay, so this one was submitted uh, by Meredy a couple of weeks ago, and um, they asked about the smoke. So there was a lot of smoke in this image, so Nigel might be experiencing something like this right now. Um, hopefully you get some clean air soon. So she, she wanted, I think Meredy's she, but I'm just going to say they. So they wanted to keep the smoke um, feel of that, but what would I do to this image, okay? So once again, this is a fairly flat image because of the lighting and the smoke. And you can see that in the histogram because it's not touching the right or white and it's not touching the blacks uh, or the left, okay? So the first thing I actually did with this image was cropped it because what's to me what's happening is there's two things drawing my attention. My eye comes in from left to right. So if you read English or in a society where you read from left to right, bottom to top, okay, some, some read the opposite way or up and down like Asian languages, okay, but if you are in a culture that reads left to right, bottom to top, your eye comes into the image from here and you kind of follow this road and then you don't go anywhere. Okay? Your eye might hop over to here to this island, but then you're sort of competing with this road and the flowers and the island. Okay, So I felt that if I got rid of this road, it would be a stronger image. Okay, So just, I'm gonna leave the bush and I'm gonna get rid of a little bit of the sky on the top. Okay? 
So for me, that's a stronger image, right? So now I sort of, my eye comes in and I follow the, the over to the flowers because they are the thing that's sharp, right? If you were watching previous episodes of these live edits, I showed how to do a little trick with the whites and the blacks. So if you're in Lightroom, hold the shift key, double click the word whites, double click blacks, and what that do does is it pops the edge of the histogram, it pops the, it spreads it out, okay? So I'm just gonna undo both of those. So watch when I do the whites, watch the histogram right here, okay? So I'm, I'm holding my mouse on the whites, on the word, not on the slider, shift key, double click, see how it just popped it right over to the right. Over on the blacks, same thing, okay? Now I'm gonna bring the highlights down because I wanna see if I can pull out some of that detail up in here in the sky. Not so much, maybe I'll darken it overall just a little bit, okay, that helps. And then I'm gonna use a graduated filter, okay? So graduated filter is exactly the same uh, as if you had a graduated filter on your camera. You pull it down from the edge. So when you pull it down from the edge, it's exactly like that, okay? So if you've got a graduated filter that you slip in front of your lens, it does exactly the same thing, okay? See that? So I've gone to extreme here just to show you what I'm doing. So I darkened the image, but I want to, to bring it down a little bit, but not that much, okay? And now you can see that this island and this little boat are coming out of the fog or the smoke a little bit. And then I'm just going to use the range mask and take it off of the darker areas because I just want it to apply sort of to the top. Okay, so very subtle. Maybe even dial my adjustments back a tiny little bit. Okay, so if you want to see what that's doing, you can toggle the tool right here. Okay, so see how it was just pure white at the top? I might even want to add a color. Okay, now here's a little trick. So when you open this color panel, you can click colors and choose a color, but if you want to choose a color that's from the image itself, okay, all you have to do is drag this guy over here. So what I did was I pressed command while I had the, the little eyedropper here and then dragged it over to the image, okay? So I want to choose like a color from the water so that the sky matches the water, okay? And it's now chosen that color for me. So that, close that one. Okay, so let's look at a before and after. So I've just punched up the contrast a little bit and brought out this this sky, but we still have the effect of having it really hazy, okay? I might add a little edge vignette, and that's just one from one of my presets. And I could decide to go back and edit my, I'm gonna add a little bit more black here so that this comes out a bit more, and a tiny bit of dehaze and keep more like that there we go okay so now i want to bring that island out but i don't want the sky to look too dark so something like that so it's, it's a dance right apply one thing come back and apply another so i would do something like that on this image um that was meredith's right how are we doing all right, I've got another few people images. Uh, Anne Ambrose sent this one in a while ago. So again, I would start with a crop on this one. So let me take it into develop. I use a lot of keyboard shortcuts, so I'm clicking the keyboard shortcuts. Um, if you could share the link to our article where I have the keyboard shortcuts and uh, downloadable PDF Rob, that would be great. All right, so this one, the first thing I'm gonna do is crop it because the subject is really over here, right? And for those of you that don't know what they're doing, um, we had a rum tasting on our uh, Cuba tour in January of last year. So it was the last tour that we were able to run and we were doing a rum and coffee tasting. Okay, so they're holding the rum up to the light, which is really great. But all this area over here really draws your attention, okay? So if you watched previously, we talked about having an image upside down. So if you look at the image upside down, your eye will naturally gravitate to the place um, where your eye is taking attention and not where your brain thinks it's supposed to go, especially if it's your image, okay? Because it's your image and so you know that we're supposed to be looking at the rum and the guys, right? But when you look at this upside down and sort of stand back a little bit, okay, your eye goes to this bright area over here. 
at least mine does. So what I want to do is instead of trying to edit it, I'm just going to crop the heck out of it. Okay. So I want to go about like that. Okay. Cause that's where I feel like the, the image, that's where the image is really happening. Okay. Now that I've done that, I can increase the whites a little bit. Now you see that I've got some clipping, which is on these highlights of the glasses. And I, I don't mind that. Okay. Cause it's a, it's going to be a bright highlight. You're going to get some clipping. I want to increase the overall, which is midtone. So exposure brings up the midtones of the image. So that's a, a myth that if overall your exposure brings up everything, brings up the midtones. Okay. We could go shadows a little bit, but what I think I'm going to do is leave it a tiny bit darker because I just want to bring out their faces and I'm going to do that with a radial filter. Okay. So that's this guy right here. So you draw a circle. Okay, now obviously I've got the wrong adjustments. Just double click the word effect. I'm going to increase the exposure, but I'm also going to increase the whites, okay? Because it's affecting the highlights, which I want. Because if I just do exposure or shadows, here I'll show you the difference. If I just do shadows, okay, it starts to sort of look HDR-ish and a little bit fake. But if I do whites, exposure, and shadows look at the difference okay so now they still have contrast uh, on everywhere on their faces okay so I like what that's doing I would probably go in and clone this this goofy sign out because now we've just got a part of it uh, let's see if Lightroom can do a decent job of it the cloning tool in Lightroom is not that great um, I might actually even take it to Luminar because it Luminar's erase tool is better, but that's not bad for now. Okay. So we'll go with that. So right off the bat, um, just a crop and a little radio filter and it really brings them out. Okay. Cause you want to think about what is the subject, where's your attention going and how can I help the viewer's eye focus on the subject, right? So getting rid of that bright part on the side and focusing on their faces and the glasses is what we want to do there. And I might even add like another um, edge vignette. Okay, so now your eye goes between the guys and his hand over here, which has this beautiful highlight on it, okay? And when you were shooting this on, and I know there was a bunch of us taking pictures at the same time, um, think about the background and the bright area there. And if you had moved a little bit to the right to get rid of the sky in the picture, then you wouldn't have, have had so much of that bright area. Okay, so think about that when you're shooting as well. How are we doing? Do I follow a workflow pattern? Um, can you be a bit more specific? And so per image or just in general, like from how do I get my image into the Lightroom or what did you mean exactly? Because I've got a nice demonstration that I want to go. Um, tell me if you're learning something, what have you guys picked up so far today? Tell me if you've picked up a tip, answer that into the chat and I'm going to um, try and answer Anne's workflow question, but tell me what you've learned. Okay, so per, per image, yes, okay. So the first thing I did was crop it because I could try doing some um, basic edits and some local edits, but I knew that I wanted to get rid of that, that cropping stuff. So I generally crop first because I know if, if I don't crop first, it's going to affect my vignette. It's going to affect the histogram, everything. So I always crop the bits out first that I don't want. Um, because you can always come back and recrop later, right? Like if I want to uh, undo some of this or expand it to be a little bit wider, I can always undo it because you're always doing what's called non-destructive editing in Lightroom. The image is still there as the original. You've just told Lightroom, I think I want to apply these edits. And only once you go into export it, oops, only once you go to export it here, will those edits apply to the new image, right? So I do crop first, then I sort of tend to do the basic edits. So I do the whites and the blacks and the shadows first. And then I look at, okay, some local edits. So global edits means the entire image. Local edits means part by part. So the local edit I did here was this part where I brightened up their faces, right? Does that help? 
learned how to work with portraits. Awesome. Um, and I think that you have Luminar, don't you, Anne? I think you do. So this one was sent in. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, so I don't want to attempt it. Um, Kwaku, I think. So he sent in, I'm not sure if this is a portrait of himself or um, something for business and a logo. So I'm assuming that you want to put this logo onto that image. So I'm actually going to show you guys how to do that using Luminar. Um, you can do it in Lightroom, but the only way to apply a logo in Lightroom is when you go to export it. Okay, so when you go to export an image, you can actually do a watermark and add it here, but you have actually very little control in Lightroom. You can only place it. For example, if I choose um, to edit one, just to show you what it looks like. Okay, so I have a logo uh, that I put in. Let's see, graphic. Okay, so if I'm gonna choose my own graphic, so I'll just choose my logo. You need to have um, what's called a PNG file, which has a um, transparent background. Okay, so you need to have something with a transparent background. Let me choose the black one. So I've got one which is white, one which is black, one which is color. Okay, so there's the black um, on transparent logo. And inside of Lightroom, you can only choose sort of where to put it, right? And you can move it around a little bit, like I can change the size, right? um, I can lower the opacity, okay? But that's about all I can do. I, I don't have a lot of, of other things, and it applies that when it exports, okay? If you want a little bit more flexibility of how that works, we are gonna do it in, in Lightroom. But first thing we need to do is get rid of this background because this image is not transparent. The background has a color to it. So I need to hop over to Photoshop to do that. Okay, you cannot do that in, in Luminar or in Lightroom. I have to open this in Photoshop, okay? If you don't have Photoshop, if you're just using Luminar, there's actually, um, I found online a, um, a website that will actually convert your images to a transparent uh, PNG file. So if you just search for free online PNG converter or something like that, you'll find an online thing where you could drop your image in and it will try and convert it for you. Okay, because what you want to do is to have all of these parts that are this kind of a white color, it's not pure white, um, dropped out into transparency. Okay, so how I'm going to do that in Photoshop, let me grab my tools here. Okay, so I work with two monitors, so my tools are usually on the other monitor. So I'm gonna grab this eyedropper tool, okay, the magic wand here. Actually, no, I want, yes, the magic wand, okay. Yeah, magic wand, okay. So when I click here, it's going to basically make a selection around everything that's that similar color, but you see that it's missed in here, um, and it's missed inside of the letters, okay. So if I go up to select uh, similar, it's going to select the similar tones, okay? But now you'll notice that I've got the white bits selected and I want the opposite, okay? So then I'm going to go select inverse, okay? And what I might do is just um, sort of uh, mask it a little bit. So I'm gonna go select subject, see if that does any good. Um, so it's going to look for the subject. Okay, so it chose the computer. I'm going to undo that. Let's go select and mask. Okay, so you can see where the mask is. Again, everything that's red is going to end up transparent. So that actually looks pretty good. So when I, when I hit um, enter, it comes back here. Now I'm just going to copy it and paste it as a new layer. So in Photoshop, that's Command or Control J. Okay, so when I do that, if I turn off this bottom layer, now you can see that all those bits are now transparent, okay? Now I just wanna check to see if I've missed any parts, if there's anything that's sort of white, okay? It looks pretty good, but I'm just gonna test it, okay? Because what I find that sometimes I end up with little parts that I've missed, so I'm just gonna create a layer below it and put red in it, okay? Because I'm gonna put bright red so that I can see if I've missed anything. Let's brighten that up. Okay, so I'm gonna just paste in red into there, okay? 
Whew, that's really red. Okay, but I'm looking for any bits of white around the edges, and you can see right there that I have missed a bit, okay? So when that gets pasted in as a logo, any of those little white bits are actually going to not look so good. So I'm gonna go back in here. Oops. I don't want to paint it red, okay? So I'm gonna go back in here, and when I double click on the Sorry. Control command click on the layer itself on the thumbnail. It does the selection again for you. Okay. So I'm just going to refine it a little bit. Okay. So I can grow the selection or I can modify it. I can feather it a little bit. And I'm just going to contract it a tiny bit by one pixel. Right. So let's see if that does a better job. I'm going to put that on a new layer. Let's check our red. So I'm just really looking for is it cleaned it up? Yes, okay. So I'm fairly happy with that. And now I wanna export that, um, I'm gonna crop it as well, because I don't need all this stuff down here. Okay, so I'm gonna crop it in. And now I'm gonna save it. So I'm gonna do a save as. I'm gonna just put it, where are we? Yes, April 17th. Okay, so logo, full color. Um, and I'm just going to change it to PNG, so I'm just going to call it transparent, and the file format I want is PNG, okay? Now it's embedding an RGB profile, okay, so let me check that, so that's another clue, uh, convert, and we're in pro photo, okay, so I'm going to, this is a color space, I'm going to convert this to sRGB, so that works better when you're dealing with web colors and so on. Okay, so yes, I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to save it as the PNG. Okay, so I'm not gonna get into color spaces today, but color spaces, um, it is a, Profoto is a larger color space um, than sRGB and it gives you more colors to work with but when you're dealing with a logo like this you actually don't need that many it's probably only three colors anyways okay so I'm gonna save this as a PNG large file now when I've done this because I opened it from Lightroom it should come back into Lightroom so when I save and close it will save the PSD as well okay so let's pop back over to Lightroom Okay, now it doesn't look transparent, but can you see the difference? That's the original, and this is the one I just created. That's the PSD. But we're gonna hop over to Luminar because now we can apply it as a logo, okay, as a watermark. Okay, when we go in here, okay, now you see a couple of different versions. So uh, this is the transparent one, I believe, right, uh, that I just created, okay. This is the transparent one. So we're going to take this image that he wants to edit, okay? And we're going to add the watermark. So you do that by going up to the local masking tool, add texture, okay? So technically the logo is going to be a texture file. So then you just have to navigate to find it. Uh, it's in this folder and I'm looking for that PNG file. Where is it? Okay, there it is. Okay, transparent. Okay, so that's the PNG transparent that I just created. Okay, so I'm choosing it. Okay, now it comes in really big, and all we have to do is resize it. Okay, so I just have to move it and grab the handles, and you can see there's the logo. But wherever I put it, it's transparent. Okay. So assuming that he wants to put it somewhere where it shows up, right? I mean, let's put it maybe over here. More space over here, let's try that. Okay, so I've placed it. Now I can increase the opacity, so it's full of opacity. Oops. Or I can change the blend mode. Okay, so I can change the blend mode to darken, for example. So then if I move it, 
um, it's only going to apply over areas where it's darker, right? So if I put it in his hair, see, you don't see it because the logo is not darker than his hair, right? It is darker than this area. And as I move it around, you'll see that it sort of disappears in the shadows, okay? That's the darken mode, okay? So I hope that gives you an idea of how to do a logo and we started with one that was not transparent so even though it was a PNG you need to have that background be transparent so if it's not you have to do that in Photoshop first or find um, a free online converter because I did find a few that were free that you literally just drop the image in and it does it for you okay now whether or not it's going to do as good a job on this one because of the cutouts in the windows and so on um, that's debatable so you just have to try it if you have a simple sort of you know um, signature file or something like that it should do a pretty good job how are we doing a lesson on blend modes Brazil uh, I don't know how to say welcome in uh, Portuguese but bienvenido how do you say tell me how you say welcome in Portuguese right yes I did coloring okay uh, let's see how are we doing um, another image if we want to do something different I'm gonna go back to Lightroom and we're gonna take a break here in a moment uh, this is another one that was sent a while ago and I can't find it now this one okay this one was sent by Sergio so um, what I would do with this image is basically just some tone control okay so I would do let me just get this down to the bottom here okay so I would work on getting her to be more standing out than the sky so if we look at this image again upside down where does your eye go okay so for me I'm drawn to the pink jacket and the white sky okay so I want to make sure that I get more attention on her face and her than the sky and the jacket okay so I'm gonna look at um, something you can do is change your camera profiles as well okay so it knows that this one was taken with um, I think this is a Olympus file yeah so an ORF raw file so Adobe knows the camera profile so you can just kind of scroll through uh, vivid does a nice job actually but it brings that jacket out even more so I'm gonna try the portrait mode portrait profile okay cuz I get more of her and I'm gonna bring the highlights down so the one thing you want to be careful of is if I bring the highlights all the way down to bring that sky out it's also taking this highlights down on her face and and her little scarf and actually kind of flattening out her face so once again you want to be careful of global edits or ones that apply everywhere because they don't necessarily do good everywhere okay so instead of applying a global edit I'm gonna go do a graduated filter so I'm gonna do one like this that's darkening okay now I'm gonna go fairly dark because I want to see what's happening in the sky and I'm gonna bring the highlights way down okay so again I do this so that I can see where it's applying and then I will scale it back and this is where the range mask really comes in handy on these tools so I'm going to do the range mask and I don't want it to apply on the dark areas I just want it to apply on the light areas so I'm gonna bring the bottom slider the left slider up okay so left is dark just like on the histogram bringing this one up means they're taking it off those areas okay so you can see that it's starting to not apply to the trees and if I turn this off okay oops well that's interesting <laughs> let's keep going and uh, have to be careful okay so now I've made kind of a mess in the trees but let me take the highlights back up all right so something like that okay but I've got a mess sort of in here with the clouds and with her face but I can see that the mask is still applying on parts of her okay so then I'll just go with a brush and erase it okay so I don't want it applying on her see that and I don't want it on this smoke and I missed a part of the trees right there right? like that and then I'll just refine it a bit so I really want to darken that sky without affecting some of the other images for some of the other parts of the image right 
So that's number one. Okay, then I'm going to do that radio filter that I did earlier to brighten the guys in Anne's image, but this time I'm going to do it opposite. So I'm going to create one around her. Now right now it's applying to the inside of the circle and it's darkening, right? But I actually want it to apply opposite, so there's a little button down here, invert, so now it's going on the outside of the circle, right? So I want to apply that, but not so strong. Okay, so dial it back. like that. And I'm not so happy with my filter up here at all. Let's just see if we can fix that. That's a little better. Okay, so I've gone from that to that. Now she really has a lot more focus on her. Okay, so all of the time when I'm doing the editing, I'm having, I have in mind of, okay, what is it that I'm trying to feature and how do I best bring that out? Whether that be a global edit or a local edit like I've done in this case, right? In terms of her jacket, if we want to tone that down a little bit, I have a couple of options. I could, you know, paint in some lower saturation with an adjustment brush, or we can go down to this HSL panel. Okay, so HSL stands for Hue, Saturation, and Lightness. So Hue will change the tint of it, which I might want to do slightly. So you can grab this little targeted tool right here. And when you click on whatever color you hover over and drag it up and down, so click and hold, you'll actually change the color of it, okay? So I could make it less pink and sort of more reddish, okay? If I don't like it, I'll just double click it. But what I really want to do is desaturate it a tiny bit, okay? not too much, and darken it. Okay, so I don't want her jacket to be as, as bright and prominent because I want her face to stand out more. Okay. Maybe change the color a tiny bit. I like this way. All right, so let's see what that's doing. See the jacket? So it's only affecting the jacket. I could do the same kind of thing if I wanted to affect the grass Okay, so it's going to brighten or darken the grass. Totally up to you, all right? Skin tone is generally orange, so if I want to brighten her, you can see that I can use the orange, and the same with saturation. So if I want to give her a little more color in her cheeks, right? And that's going to vary based on skin tone to skin tone, but you'll find that most people have some orange in their skin tone. I think it's time for a little break. Uh, we're going to go into a couple minute intermission here. So uh, go and get your coffee or wine or beer or whatever time of day it is where you are. And I'll be right back and see if I can fix some of these technical issues that I've got going on right now. So we will be right back.
Okay, <laughs> I think I fixed some of my my technical issues while you were gone. Yes, we need uh we needed some music during intermission. So Rob, was there any questions that I missed? Dodge and burn. Which which photo, Anne, on the uh, one with the little girl in the fire? Yes, you could certainly do dodge and burn on that one. But I would probably start with a vignette in Luminar, if you're using Luminar, um, to do the same thing I did with the radio filter, something like that. Um, no questions. Okay, so I think I've got my camera fixed, so let's go back over here. So now you can see me! Yay! Um, so I've got a few more landscape photos and a couple others that we haven't done um, this type of thing before, but I wanted to go through a few of these images. I did this last week as well on some images that um, I wasn't really able to do anything with editing and because I want to talk about, you know, what can be done and and where you have limitations with photo editing, okay? So I'm not really sure what the purpose of this image is. Obviously this guy is printing something, maybe it's for a, a corporate shot, that kind of thing. Um, there's not really a lot that I can do to edit this photo. I would do some basics just to enhance the the tone. Um, let me see if it, nah, it doesn't recognize the camera. So I probably just do my little trick with the double click on the sliders, check if anything is clipping. Okay, so I'm doing that by holding the Alt Option key and then clicking on Highlights. And I can see that there's some highlights that are clipping. So clipping means off the chart on the top end, meaning no detail. Okay, so you can see as I pull this down, the histogram is affected and it brings those highlights into, into the graph, right? So just a couple of small tonal adjustments. I might lift the shadows a little bit. Um, and if I'm not sure if the color is off, I could try this little eyedropper here. Assuming that this um, thing here is black, I could just click on that. And all I did was take a little bit of magenta out. So other than that, there's not a whole lot that I would do to this image other than maybe add a little edge vignette. Um, and that's about it. Okay, so there's not a lot that I could do in terms of bringing out uh, the image. Maybe adding another radio filter just to darken the edges a little bit. Not that much and to bring attention into what he's doing here, right? Now, one thing you can do with the radio filter is you can actually duplicate it, okay? So here's a little trick. So I'm using this one to darken the edges, but if I wanna actually brighten the inside at the same time, just right click on where the dot is and choose duplicate, right? So now I have it duplicating and it's still doing the outside. So then I'm gonna invert it, double set it, double reset it by double clicking effect and then I'm going to increase the exposure in the middle, right? And I can also move it around so that it's not exactly the same. Okay, so I'm going to make it slightly different shape and just make sure he has some contrast. Okay, so when I turn this, this on and off, you can see that it's just kind of ever so slightly bringing the focus into the center of the image um, and off of the outer parts of the image. Okay, so you want to bring the attention more in towards him and what he's doing. Maybe even a bit of more on the highlight area, like that, right? So again, you want to keep it so that it's not super obvious, right? You don't want it to say, to look like a vignette. I just want to ever so slightly pull attention in. Okay, so you can see that that's a very subtle adjustment, right? But look at the difference, right? So this is kind of overall tonal range versus now my eye goes into what he's doing. A uh, couple of other images that were just submitted this week from <clears throat> Jean Vieve. Uh, yes, my mouse batteries are low, <laughs> it keeps telling me. Okay, so I'm going back here again. Um, these are JPEGs and there's only so much I can do with a JPEG, but also depending on how the image was shot, there's only so much I can do in terms of editing to 
to correct or fix things that that need to go back to the camera to fix them when you're shooting okay so things like like um, this one here where she's got really bright sun and contrasty lighting on her face this one that this one would be something you need to go back into camera okay so there's a lot of stuff clipping here there's lots of overexposed areas including parts of her face so I can try and call and bring that back but likely because it's a JPEG there's not going to be a lot of detail there. So see, even if I pull it back, right, as far as I go, there's no detail in her face. It's just sort of gray, right? So that's because that's a JPEG and because the sun is so contrasty. So if this was an image that you really needed to have, I would probably actually turn this one into black and white because you can kind of get away a bit more with, with these kinds of overexposures and highlights than you can in color. And I might crop this one a little bit differently, right? So I might actually come into her head and come in from the bottom. I'm not sure about the finger here either, but this puts more focus on her face as opposed to the stuff sticking out the top. And then just do a little vignette, right? So I would probably do something like that because the image is quite uh, overexposed and you could get away with a black and white conversion on that one. These are some quick edits. Right? Uh, this one here, you want to look out for things cutting through people. Okay, So the barn here, um, this was taken with a 45mm lens at f45. Okay, So you want to think about, um, Rob, if you could share the article on Aperture. It's, um, we'll talk about depth of field, right? So in, when you're shooting at f25, which is a very small aperture, everything is going to be in focus. So you've got the girl in focus. Um, actually, she's not super in focus and the background as well. Okay, so if you want to get that background out of focus, you need to do uh, three things, okay? One you've already done, which is she's far away from it, okay? Number two is use a longer lens because you'll get less of that background and more what's called background compression. And number three, use a much wider aperture. Okay, so I don't know what the maximum aperture is on this lens. Let me see what lens you used here. I'm not sure. 18 to 55. Okay, so it's on a Canon. So you probably have even f4, f5.6. So if you open it up as wide as you can at that focal length, you'll get a lot more of that background out of focus and you need a longer lens. So shoot, zoom in more, zoom in more and go to an even longer than 55 if you have it. Okay. In terms of lighting, um, Rob, maybe share a link to our portrait um, mini series, free email series. So you can sign up for portrait tips and you'll get a series of articles sent to you by email that talk about portrait lighting and so on, where you actually want to get her her out of the sun, which you've done, but the background as well. Okay, so it still goes back to those four things in the background that are taking attention. Okay, and we talked about those in previous weeks if you've if you've joined in, and that are that is things which are bright, overly contrasty, bright colors, and sharp. Okay, so here we've got sharp and bright colors. Right, sharp and and. Uh, brightness okay so those things are taking attention away from her as well as this sort of little stick thing in the foreground that's ca catching a lot of contrast against her dress so all of these elements are fighting against trying to make her into the subject right so I could do a ton of editing to try and minimize some of those things but on honestly the best option here is to go back to um, go back to the camera and try and reshoot this with um, a little bit less distracting background. Right. Let's see if that, okay, so that helps. And then I can lighten her face and I could do this in Luminar as well, okay? Um, I have a little preset called Dodge Face. Uh, where are we, there we go. Right. So I wanna be careful not to do the sky, but the face light, so notice how I had to do that with a radio filter, okay? And then I had to choose a preset that I've created for my radio filter, which applies plus exposure, shadows, whites, and minus blacks to put that on her face. Whereas in Luminar, I could just drag that one slider and it wouldn't affect the sky at all. So here I have to be careful of affecting all the areas around her face um, and place it precisely and all those things in Luminar, one slider, right? 
So you can see that I can do a little bit of work to help that, right? And that's about as, as good as this one's going to get without going back to do a reshoot, okay? Okay, I don't know if Linton is watching. Um, he's in New Zealand, but this one is obviously shot through a window. So there's a few problems here in that you've got the windowsill, the edge of the window, and a reflection, okay? So it's impossible to get rid of the reflection after the fact. Um, if you wanna shoot through like hotel windows and things like that, you wanna make sure that you're using a polarizing filter and a tripod so that you can get right up to the window. Or I actually saw this new tool, um, it might have come up as a Kickstarter or something on my Facebook feed where it's a big like rubber lens hood that's kind of uh, flexible and you put it up against the window when you're shooting against a window like this and it helps to cut the reflections, okay? Um, if you have the room lights off in your room, that would also help because it looks like there's a reflection of the bed or something here. So room lights off and everything dark. Um, wear some darkness yourself, wear dark clothes or put a dark cloth around the um, tripod and the camera and then try try that again. So the reflections are really impossible to, to retouch here, okay? You'd have to do a lot, a lot of work, and honestly, you still probably wouldn't come out with something that you'd be really happy with, right? Um, ISO 200, F14, 20 seconds. Okay, so 20 seconds. I see he's trying to get the light trails here, right? It's also quite yellow, so we could try an automatic white balance adjustment and see what it does. Okay, so it's dialed the white balance down. I might bring it back just a tiny bit, but that's a good choice. And I'm gonna do my little trick with the blacks because there's no black here. And let's see, so there's a bit of highlights clipping, but it's mostly light sources, so that's not so bad. And we're gonna do a crop here to get rid of this windowsill over here. And maybe even from here, because your subject is really sort of down here with what's going on, right? And that's probably as much as you can really do with this image. There's not a lot you can do um, for these reflections here. Okay, so I've increased the contrast again, fixed the white balance, and done a crop, right? Shooting through hotel windows is, is a tricky business. I've done it myself, and it's kind of hit and miss, right? Especially if you've got other people in the room with you that want the lights on and you want to shoot in the dark. Okay, so good attempt but it's a, it's a tricky subject um, to handle in the first place I wanted to cover uh, something we haven't done yet somebody sent in this is from Patricia so she sent in this um, I want to say is he a, no he's not a stork it must be a crane I think it's a crane okay so I think he's a whooping crane or a sandhill crane um, we saw these guys in Texas, and I wanted to show you again how to punch up the contrast. And we'll do this one. We'll do this one in uh, Lightroom, and then we'll actually do it in Luminar to compare. Okay. So I haven't done any editing, and we look at the histogram first. Okay. So the first thing I look at, remember, is cropping, and then I look at the basics like blacks and whites and my histogram. Okay. Can the cropping be improved on this? Actually, it's not so bad. The only th thing I might do is come up a little bit from the bottom and a little bit from this side just to put him a slightly more sort of his body off center so even though his head is in this middle section he's he's kind of leaning in right so he's off he's off center um, <laughs> I like the fact that he's only standing on one leg that's awesome so I'm gonna do the shift double click on the whites shift double click blacks so after a quick crop you know, we've gone from that to that with two clicks of the mouse and a quick crop. I'm going to add a vignette, okay? But remember inside of Lightroom, the vignette always is centered. So I can't put it off center, but I'm gonna use my, these are my Lightroom presets. If you could share a link to the presets, please, Rob. So I have a series of vignettes, among other things, that you can just apply with one click, okay? So right off the bat, we've got that, and then I'm gonna increase clarity. Okay, so the difference between clarity and contrast, um, there's another article for you to link up. Rob's busy in the chat finding all of these things as I just sort of spew them out. So you wanna find one that's clarity versus contrast, okay? 
So Clarity, let's drag this all the way to the right. So what Clarity does is it looks for edge contrast. So the difference between this bird's beak and the background, for example, and then it tries to increase the difference between those two things. Okay, so see how that looks, okay? And I'm just gonna make a virtual copy here and show you the opposite. Okay, so I'm going to take clarity back to zero and increase the contrast. Okay, so look at how different that looks. Okay, so that's contrast at 100 versus clarity at 100. Okay, so they're very different. Contrast increases the contrast of the image overall and it stretches the histogram out. So if you watch the graph as I slide this contrast slider to the left, it's squishing it together and to the right, it's expanding it out, but it's doing so from the middle. Okay, so that's why I use um, the black and the white sliders because I have more control over adjusting it. And then if I want some uh, contrast sort of in the middle, then I will use this slider as well. Okay. We can also use curves to do the same idea. Okay. Do you guys wanna see curves? Anybody wanna see curves? Questions, questions? Uh, it's just called, um, oh, it's called depth of field for the aperture article, Ron. Okay, so if you want to see curves as opposed to contrast, so contrast stretches the, the graph out, okay? If we go to tone curve, which is the next one down, it will do the same kind of thing, okay? Now notice here the histogram has a spike and fall on the edges. And you see in the background of the curves, you see the histogram, okay? So it's exactly the same, dark on the left, white on the right, okay? So if I pull this one down, I'm lowering the whites, okay? If I pull this one up, oops, wrong one. If I pull this one up, I'm lowering the blacks or getting rid of the blacks. So I'm actually making like a faded out black. If I go this way, I'm increasing the blacks, okay? So play around with the curves um, slider. So this one's increasing white, decreasing white, okay? If I want to add a curve, okay, so you can see that this is not a curve, it's actually a straight line. But if I make it a point here, and I make a point here, and drag it so that it's more the shape of an S, okay? So S curve, you can see that the contrast has increased, see that? So it gives you a bit more control than just the contrast slider because if I don't want to increase the the highlights so much, I want midtones, I can actually put a third point on, okay? So I can adjust the S curve in the lower areas as opposed to affecting the whole graph, okay? So I have a bit more control using curves. You can put as many points on as you want. Wilma likes to double click on the black and the white. Um, actually, there's a video and an article we have on the website, Rob, on using the basic sliders in Lightroom, and that will give you a really good overview of, I uh, explain that tip again there as well, okay? So when I'm applying things like clarity and texture, I wanna just kinda do both of those to the max. What I wanna do is, is show you why you don't wanna apply that globally. Because look what's happening. So we're working on a JPEG. So once again, we've got limited um, amount of information in the file and the background is going really sort of textury and grainy because of, of this texture slider. So I wanna uh, minimize the use of these sliders globally. I wanna just have a little bit of clarity and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it just on the bird because I want to uh, increase his um, feathers. I want to get a little bit more um, texture on his feathers. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit. And I'm going to use an adjustment brush to do that. So J is the keyboard shortcut for adjustment brush. Sorry, K. K is adjustment brush. And I'm just going to reset it. And I want to increase that texture slider and the clarity a little bit more. So I'm gonna go fairly high with texture and I'm gonna paint with about 50% flow. So when I did the dodge and burn, remember I painted things in gradually, okay? So I do the same whenever I'm doing the adjustment brush here. So 50% and I'm just gonna start painting in. I'm gonna use a little bit bigger brush. I'm just gonna start painting in on his feathers. Now it's subtle, you're not gonna see it, but when I zoom in on his feathers, we should be able to see what's happening here, okay? So I should be giving him some more texture all over without affecting the background, okay? 
I could do his legs as well if I want, but I'm just kind of doing a really quick job here. Okay, if you want to see where you've painted, O on the keyboard will show the overlay. Okay, if you don't see it in green, you might be seeing a different color. You can just click Shift O. So Shift O will change the color of the overlay. Okay, so you can have it as red. I usually use red or green just because it's the easiest to actually um, see visibly. Okay. So now I've painted that in. Uh, let's take a look. Okay, so let's zoom in on this bird now. So let's do a before and after. So we're looking at the feathers. Okay, so see how that one is really bringing out the texture of just the feathers. Okay, so I can see where I've painted. If I just turn it off, just affecting him. Okay. So that's about what I would do with this one here. Okay. Let's do the same one in Luminar. So I'm going to go back over here. So the first thing I'm going to do is see if there's a template that Luminar will suggest. Okay. So up at the top here, it will suggest templates that it thinks will apply for your image. So look at the very first one, Animal Friends. This is why I love Luminar A so much, okay? So it, it's so smart, it knows that I've got something of an animal in this picture, okay? How it knows that, I don't know, but it's brilliant, okay? So look at one click, and we're already pretty close to what I had in Lightroom, right? After multiple paintings, okay? Just clicking through. The first one so far was about the best. But let's take a look at some of the others available. Okay, Savannah. Okay, so also looks like more animal scenes. This one's a little bit cooler, right? That looks nice. So evening chill. Actually, that looks quite nice. That one looks quite nice. So if I want it warmer, I want it cooler. This one's going to be black and white. And my mouse battery died. <laughs> I will be right back. Let me just grab a mouse battery if there's any questions. Uh, pop those in the chat while I grab my batteries. So I use a um, Mac mouse. Uh, it's a magic mouse and a rechargeable battery. So I just have to stick those back in again. All right. Yes, one of those days. Everything. Okay, let's reconnect this mouse. There we go. Okay. Instant result. So I think so far I still like that first one. Um, I'm just trying them all just to see what they do. And then I can go in and edit. Okay, so I always kind of start with a template just to see what, what which one is going to get me the closest. And then go and um, alter it. Actually, that's pretty nice too. So I'm looking at the bird, not so much as the background. So it's doing a really nice job on the bird. And I know that I can probably go and mask some of the tools in there to minimize that on the background. So I'm actually gonna start with that one, okay? So I choose that one and now I can either go in here and adjust each of the tools or filters separately, or I can dial down the overall look of the entire um, template, okay? So I like the whole effect. I'm going to leave it up high. And then I'm going to go and find the tools that it's used. Okay, so Luminar marks those with a little dot for me. Okay, so it actually hasn't done too many. Okay, so it's done definitely structure. So I anticipated that one just because I know what that tool does. Okay, so if I turn this one off, okay, you could see that that one is the one that is doing that punchiness on the background, but it's doing a nice job on the bird. Okay, so what I want to do is mask this one so that it is not on the bird, okay? Or sorry, it's not on the background. So I'm actually going to paint it in. So you have two choices when you do a mask. Uh, you can paint it in or out. I choose to paint in if the area that I want this filter to apply to is smaller than the area that I don't want it to apply to. So in that case, the bird, okay? So I'll probably paint with a high opacity. And I'm just gonna start in here. And as soon as I start painting, you see that it disappeared on the background, okay? So you see that it's only applying where the red is now, where the um, mask is applying. 
and not on the background. So as soon as I clicked, it got removed off the background. And I could probably do a better job and, and go in here and erase, you know, because I overpainted a little bit on the edges and do a little better job here. But I'm just trying to do a, a kind of a quick and dirty example. If I was doing this, I would zoom in to 100% as well. Okay, So I would make sure to get in nice and tight. Okay, So we can zoom in. Zoom in over here. Okay, so I would always do this probably at 100% so I can see what's happening. Spinny wheel. <laughs> uh, is, it too, is it too early to have a beer? All right, so let me grab that. My computer does not like me today. I'm just going to apply this one. There we go. And now let's see what it has done. So now I've removed the structure from that background. So it's only applying on the bird. So I'm actually going to take it farther now just to see what it's doing. Okay, so let's take it to extreme. So you can see how it's really punching up the texture and so on of the bird. Okay, now that's important because what we're going to do is we're actually going to do the same thing down in this details panel. Okay, so I'm going to go back into the mask use these little three dots here and copy the mask because I want to use the same mask on details but opposite so I'll show you that okay so under details this is where it allows you to sharpen things and increase small details I'm going to take this one up high again just so you can see what it's doing okay so it's increasing details everywhere but we just want it on the bird right so I'm going to paste the mask Okay, now wait for this because what's going to happen is it's going to uh, only apply this to the bird. Okay, so pasting in, right? See, there's that mask again. Same thing. Now it's only applied these sharpening effects to the bird. I'm going to take it really far so that you can see it. Okay. I want to apply it a little bit down here on the ground as well. So I'm just going to add to this mask, paint it in but a lower opacity, right? So I want to just give him a little bit of sharpness where he's standing, okay? Sort of that strip of the dirt where he's standing. Now I've taken that to extreme so that you can see it, right? You can see that the bird has a ton more detail, but it's also, I've, my mask is not perfect because I've got it on the background, okay? So I could go in and refine that and then let's just bring these sliders back to something a little bit more realistic, okay? So I've taken these too far on purpose just to show you where that mask is, okay? So that's how you can use a mask from one image to the next, right? I would also add a vignette on this image, which the template didn't do. So I'll just go in and do my usual thing, darken, change it to feather zero, then let's make it a little bit smaller. I'm not so much worried about keeping his leg in, so I'm just gonna go like that. And I could probably even go smaller and then just move it up a little bit so we, we get him. And I'm just clicking around until I get it in the position that I want. Put the feather back and put the amount a little bit softer. So let's compare. So we've got this one. Okay, let's go back to Lightroom. Pretty similar, right? So you could do the same kinds of things in whatever program you're using. And I realize I didn't crop the other one, right? And just just different methods, different tools, but you can come to the same result, right? Where you can't do things. Um, if I wanted to do the same kind of thing in, in Luminar, I use the mask on each tool. If I want to do that in Lightroom, I have to use the adjustment brush and paint that tool in, okay, or paint that thing in. Some of the things that you can't do in Lightroom are things like adding a texture or something that I love to do a lot, which is adding mood. And this tool is called a LUT. So it's a lookup table, okay, which means it's a color effect. 
So I'm just going to increase the amount so that when I choose one, as you scroll the mouse over, it shows you a preview. So this is kind of like a, a cinematic grading or styling, like a, think, of, think movie poster, okay? And I love to use these because there's a lot of really great ones in here that, again, I turned it up higher so you could see it. If you like the style, you can just turn it down a little bit, okay? So this candlelight one actually was kind of nice. Right? Or you might want to get something that's a bit warmer if you want to warm it up. A little bit more brown. Oops. I think I missed it. That's the one I wanted. Okay? So if you like the amount, you can increase it. If you want more of that effect, wait for my computer to catch up to me. Or less of the effect. Okay? More, less. So you can see that it's actually even punching up the contrast a little bit. So I love that one. Um, another one that I use a lot is Mystical uh, in Lightroom. In Lightroom, there isn't really something similar. You could probably try and do like a lowered clarity and um, affect it, but it's, it gives you a very different look. So Mystical for me is one that kind of gives this sort of blurry effect. Okay, now let's say I want to do that, but apply it to the background. Okay, so similar to what we did earlier but I'm using this tool instead of structure. So I'm gonna paste in that same mask and then invert it because I don't wanna blur the bird, I wanna blur the background. Okay, so now you can see that I'm sort of blurring that background a bit more. I hope, <laughs> okay. Like so and then dial it down. So I like Mystical, um, I also like the Glow for Orton effect. So the, um, the effects that you can do in both programs are very similar, unless you want to add a texture. Mm, let's see if I got an image here that would, uh, would work with a texture. Uh, we haven't done a texture. This one here might be kind of interesting. Right, so this one here um, was submitted by Evo. Oh, Evo's here. Okay, so uh, how do you pronounce your name? Guatam. Uh, can Canon DPP do such editing? I'm not a super fan of, of either the Nikon or the Canon editing software. Um, I'm a big believer in working with a company that specializes in photo editing software, like Canon makes cameras, they, they're not expertise in making software. Um, and to be honest, the, I don't even use Apple software, right? Um, I think Apple is expert in making hardware, not software. That's my personal opinion. And I'm sticking to it, all right? <laughs> uh, Mike says, no, it's not too early for beer. Okay, good. Yes, it's definitely afternoon here, Mike. Um, am I using Luminar as a standalone model or a plug-in from Lightroom? It doesn't matter. So I'm, I use it as both, Wilma. So right now we're looking at the standalone version, okay? So if I'm editing it in the standalone version, you'll see this export button. If I want to do the same image, um, let's take it over to Lightrooms and, and do that then. Okay, so if I want to do that same image from Evo, and I want to edit it in Lightroom and then add a texture, then I would hop over to Luminar, okay? So I'm gonna do the shift double click trick here and I'm gonna pull the highlights down because I think what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get a bit more color in there. And I think it's crooked a little bit, so I'm gonna use the crop tool and auto to see if I can correct that. See how it corrected the tilt a little bit, okay? And I think that's pretty good. Um, Cropping, I do, I'm debating on this one because there's a lot of foreground, but there's a lot of interesting things in the foreground. Let's just see what happens if we come up a little bit. Okay, if, if I get rid of that rock in the foreground, I do like the idea of having this almost as a frame, but I feel like I wanna have like a boat or something in the middle. I feel like it's almost missing something in the middle. Okay. If I come more like this, it feels a little bit empty. So I'm going to leave the leave the rock. Okay. So when you're shooting a scene like this, um, keep in mind that you want a focal point because where my eye is going right now is this little white sort of hut here. If you had uh, a snorkeler or were lucky enough to have a dolphin <laughs> jumping out of the water, I know you can't schedule that. Even a boat, right? 
um, or a person standing over here on the rock. So you need something to draw the attention, even a bird flying through the sky in this area or something, okay? So we can actually add that in, in uh, actually possibly not. We could possibly add it in Luminar, okay? Let's say I wanna do finish doing my basic edits in here. I'm not gonna add any um, sharpening or texture because this is a JPEG and it looks like he's already sharpened it. So I don't wanna add any more sharpening, okay? We could go into the HSL panel and affect the colors here if we want to darken the water, which is kind of neat, okay? So that looks like it makes makes the water look deeper, doesn't it? Okay, so I'm gonna darken that a little bit and maybe I wanna play with that sky, okay? So let's actually brighten the sky a little bit. So I wanna find a happy balance because you'll notice that as I'm darkening the water, the sky is also darkening. And that's actually one of the drawbacks of this HSL tool in Lightroom is that you can't apply it locally, okay? If I try and um, use the paintbrush tool, okay, there's no HSL that you can paint in, okay? So I might actually do that in Luminar because with Luminar, I can paint that tool in. So I could apply it just to the water and not to the sky. So let's just do it a little bit so it's not affecting the sky too much. And I wanna see if I can darken this area over here. So I'm gonna click here and yeah, it's yellow. So I'm gonna bring that down a little bit. And then we can decide, okay, do we wanna add saturation in here? Yeah, let's maybe punch up that water, look at that. And I wanna lower the saturation here because I don't want this taking attention. Okay, so just using the HSL, we've really sort of increase the um, eye towards the water, okay? Now, there's not much more I would probably do here in in Lightroom. See, it's affecting the trees as well when I do this. Uh, let's just play around with that. That's about all I would do in Lightroom, maybe a slight edge vignette. So let's hop over to Luminar, okay? So where I want to go with this one is to play with that HSL and let's even try a texture on it, okay? So right click, edit in Luminar AI. So the difference between, um, and I wanna do it with a copy with edits, okay, so this one. The difference between opening it directly into Luminar and doing these things versus opening it from Lightroom, going to Luminar and back again, is that once I bring this image and I save it, so it's gonna create a new TIFF when I'm finished in Luminar, bring it back into Lightroom, I can't then take it back to Luminar and go from where I left off, right? The edits that happen in Luminar, when you save it and bring it back to Lightroom are baked in, okay? So they are finished. Okay, it doesn't want to open it, probably because I have Luminar opened already. I'm just going to close some of my tools here. Okay, that's the other version of Luminar. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out which one it's got. I've got two versions of Luminar opening here. Where the heck is it? There we go. Okay. So now you can see that instead of when I switch to the other one, this one has an export button. So you can always tell whether you're in Luminar standalone because there's an export button versus the other one, which is apply. Okay. So I already know what I want to do this one. I'm not going to do um, a template. I'm going to go and do that HSL. So that's under the color panel and I want to play with those colors again. So there isn't one of those little fun funky adjustment tools in here, but I'm just gonna play around because I know it's cyan in the water, right? So you can see the water. So I wanna darken that to make the lagoon look a little deeper. You'll notice that there's also some green in the water and blue affects more of the sky. But if I want to affect the blue in the water and not the sky, this is where I would do it and mask out that part of the sky. Okay, so I'm just gonna use a gradient mask, drag it down, okay? Now, remember that it's affecting the part that's red, okay? Not the other part. Let me just turn that off. So turn this one off. So right now it's affecting the sky. So we wanna invert that mask. 
so that it's affecting the water. Okay. So see now I can use the HSL tools and just apply it to the water like I want it. Okay. Let's try the Enhance AI on the Sky Enhancer. Let's see what it does here. Okay. So you have to be careful of going too far and what too far looks like is, can you see there's this sort of little outline happening around the horizon there? Okay. That's too far because it's pulling the sky um, darker and it's creating this little outline. Okay. So you want to be careful you don't get that. Okay, but this Sky Enhancer is doing a better job than, it, than I was doing in Lightroom with that tool of um, the HSL. I want to see what Accent does as well. Okay, now it's trying to brighten up the dark areas. It's actually giving a little bit of punch overall to the image. Lots of color enhancement, so that's kind of nice. Um, okay. Now, Augmented Sky, I'm going to try something here because you can add birds into the sky. Um, and I want to see if it'll allow me to place the birds in the water because it will place them in the sky, okay? But if I want to have them flying over the water, I don't know if it will show up there. No. So you see how, again, Luminar is smart because it knows the horizon is here and birds aren't going to be below the horizon. So as soon as I dragged it below the horizon, the birds disappeared, okay? So I'd have to do it another way if I wanted to put birds, but I could put them up here if I want. So if I want some birds, just to add interest, okay. And Relight Slider actually helps to blend the birds in a little bit, so it kind of fades them out, okay. So you notice as I increase the Relight Slider, they sort of get faded out into the clouds versus really bright. So I'm gonna just relight them a little bit, and you could even defocus them, okay. So I kind of like what's happening with the birds there. It gives it something interesting. And I'm also going to go and add a texture on this one, okay? Partly because I think it might add some interest here. There's, um, there's not a lot happening, so I'm going to go and see if I can add a texture to create a little bit of interest here. Um, Rob, please share a link to our texture pack um, and our sky pack. So texture pack is all images that are high res that I shot in Cuba. So when I uh, you just have to navigate to the folder where your images are and then just kind of scroll through them. There isn't a way to preview them inside of Luminar other than like as I'm doing here, I'm just kind of scrolling through the thumbnails, right? Um, through here in my in my window browser, my finder browser. Um, and I just want to find one that I think might look interesting. Actually, this one might look interesting. So it's got lots of the similar colors, okay? So it's kind of got some paint, crumbling paint, pinks and blues. So I'm going to pick that one. And when it loads it in, it comes in at 50% opacity. Oops, where'd it go? Apparently I hit enter too fast. Okay, I don't know why it's not loading for me. There we go. Okay, so I can adjust the opacity. So if we increase it to 100%, the layer that has the texture on it is now not see-through, okay? If we lower it to 0%, it's lowering the opacity of the texture so I can see through the texture to the background image, okay? So it comes in as by default at 50%, okay? Then you could change the blend mode. So that was something that somebody asked about earlier, okay? So blend modes, what the blend modes do, and I'm gonna turn this up really high, okay? So you can see right now, blend mode is zero, meaning that it only applies sort of as a normal event, okay? When I change the blend, for blend mode from normal to darken, for example, now you see that only parts of the texture show. Which parts are showing are those parts in the texture that are darker than the underlying image, okay? So that's why it's called darken. So anything in this section, darken, multiply, or color burn, will only affect images that um, parts of the image that are darker, but in different ways. Okay, so multiplying is adding it, color burn is even darker. Okay, lighten shows parts of the texture that are lighter than the original image. Same with screen. Okay, overlay, soft light, and hard light 
uh, combine the two and they add contrast, combining the original image and the texture. Okay, so I find that I like overlay or screen a lot. So overlay is actually pretty good in this case and I'm just gonna bring the opacity down a little bit. Okay, so kind of making it look like, like a watercolor painting a little bit. It's increased the saturation a whole bunch if you can see that. So I could turn the saturation down a bit if I want. Right. Or I could turn the contrast down a little bit. Because the contrast and saturation here are only affecting the, uh, the texture, okay? So contrast and the texture only, okay? So that just means it's gonna show up less. Saturation and the texture only, okay? So see the original image is not getting saturated, but the texture, if you look in the sky, okay? So now I just have the blobs of texture versus saturation up, you see the pink, okay? So I actually kind of like it desaturated, so it just looks like it's a it's a painting, right? I can also flip the texture back and forth, or up and down, okay? Actually, this this position, that position looks pretty good. Okay? Then if I like what it's doing, I can just dial it down a little bit if it's maybe too much opacity, so that it's got kind of a subtle effect, and then close it up. So now that I've applied that, okay, so I've done the birds and I've done the texture and I've done the HSL, all things which I can't do in Lightroom, okay? You can't add birds or another layer, you can't add a texture, and you can't paint in the HSL like I did here, okay? Now I'm going to apply it. So once I hit apply, it's going to take this image, add all the stuff I've done in Luminar to it, and create a new finished image, okay? But like I said, it's baked in. So when I come back to Lightroom, I can't reopen it again in Luminar and go back to editing where I left off. Okay, so let's hop back over to Lightroom. Okay, and there it is in Lightroom. Okay, so you'll notice that it's a TIFF image, okay? So there's the original, and there's the edit edited TIFF. Okay, but if I try and open this one again in Luminar, it's already going to have these effects applied. So let's take a look at those side by side. Okay. So look at the difference. I've kind of punched up the color and made it look more like a painting. Um, the birds, I could take or leave the birds. It was just something I did for fun because I felt like it needed something there in the sky. But I do still feel like it needs um, a boat or some sort of focus in the water. But it's a very pretty image with lots of really pretty colors that have now been enhanced and it looks a little bit like a painting. So what do you think of my edit of that, Evo? Oh, and I've lost my chat. <laughs> I've lost my chat. Let me see if I can get back to my chat window here. Oops. All right. Let me get back to my chat. I have to go back to YouTube. Hang on there with me. I'm just coming back to you guys. I can't find my chat. All right. Um, do you have any questions? I'd love to hear from uh, Evo in particular uh, that, you know, did you like my edit on this image? Maybe how did you edit it? Um, anybody that I've edit your, edited your image today, so Holly, Barb, Sergio, Richard, um, who else did I edit? Patricia, anybody whose images I've edited today, um, let me know what you think. If you've edited it differently, I'd love to know what your edit looks like. Okay. Got my chat again, I think. No, I don't. There we go. Okay. All right. What did I miss? Uh, I think he was here. Yeah, I thought he was the one from uh, Brazil. Um, let's see. Do you need to buy the effects? Um, Luminar does not come with textures. It does come with some skies. Um, if you go into like the special effects templates, they do have a few textures there, but they're more um, like light leaks and things like that. So you do either need to make your own or purchase your own. And we do have a set of texture packs. That's the, um, if you use our, 
our discount code, you can get 25% off our, our texture pack. So if you can give that information to um, Guatam, Rob, that would be great. Do I think the leafy framework around your daughter was too distracting or it worked well? Your house property was cluttered and that was the best spot you could find. Yes, um, actually I do think that the greenery around her worked really well. Uh, let me go back. So I'm going back to Laya Luminar because I edited that one there. This one here, Holly. Yes, I do think this one works really well. Um, the one thing you want to be conscious of here is you've got a really high shutter speed. You've got 1 over 640, um, f1.8, and a, an ISO 1000. So it's a little bit grainy. Um, I would recommend using a tripod when you're working in an area like this because it's going to be fairly dim light and then you can get away with a much slower shutter speed and lower ISO. But when you're also working with f1.8, you want to make sure that you get the focus absolutely perfect because there's a little bit of, of movement here or it could be movement in her, um, but she's not perfectly sharp. Like when we look at it here at 100%, um, it's not loaded yet, but when we look at it at 100%, it's not 100% sharp on her face. So I would use, I recommend using a tripod, but this location is great, you know, like you could go back to this spot again um, and, and work here. Okay, so why it's not zooming into me, I don't know. My computer has gremlins today, I swear to God. Awesome. Okay, so that answers Holly's question, I think. Yes, sky packs, texture pack. Video and audio is out of sync. Interesting. Uh, I think you had it on auto ISO. Uh, you were having issues with back button focus. Okay. So probably what's happening is, Holly, if you're using back button focus and you're standing holding the camera and she's standing, even just if you move back and forth a tiny bit or she does, because you've got that really narrow depth of field of the 1.8, it could have moved. That's all. So I would say use a tripod because then at least you can eliminate your movement and just make sure that she knows not to sort of lean back and forth. And you could probably, you know, shoot at like 2.8 and, and still get a really nice soft background, but give yourself a little bit more latitude in terms of the depth of field. But this is a really, a really beautiful location. Um, and I would definitely shoot here again, um, depending on the time of day, like you've got beautiful light coming in here. Did you use a flash or anything on this one, Holly? Because you've got really nice light on her eyes. Like she's got some really nice light coming in. Um, I think I answered the one about Lightroom versus Luminar, Luminar versus plugin or stand-in, standalone. Um, I just demonstrated the plugin version. So it doesn't matter. You can still create the same things in Luminar, whether you're using it as a plugin or a standalone. But the difference is that if you're using Lightroom, Lightroom has more sort of, um, sorting tools and pro tools you can do things like rename batch rename edit the metadata you know things like in here you can change the caption or the title add your copyright information you can do um, things like rate your image with a color or a flag or a, a rating inside of luminar they only have flags for picks for favorites so they don't have stars or colors so you just have a little bit less limiting um, sort of sorting and cataloging um, options than you do in Lightroom but Lightroom is a subscription program that's the other thing is you pay Adobe um, $9.99 a month for the photographers package that's US uh, and you have to pay that indefinitely so you if you stop paying you lose access to your Lightroom edits Luminar is the purchase where you own it okay so each time they come out with an update if it's um, if it's a one point something update which is where they're on now we're at 1.2 you get that as a free update 1.3 1.4 when they come out with update 2.0 um, then it will be a paid update, but you don't have to do it. Okay, so if you choose to stay with the version you have, you don't have to pay to upgrade. It's totally optional. Okay, so those are the main differences is the um, the subscription model versus paid. <laughs> um, 
So that means you're not using a tripod because you're too much of a spaz. <laughs> okay, that's funny. So I think we've um, done several images today. I've shown lots of different versions with people. So I hope that gives everybody, specifically Richard was asking for some people edits, some ideas on how to do those. We did a Sky non-replacement and um, played with some adding things into Sky's a watermark bird texture and um, adding a texture overlay. So we did lots of different things today. Please keep submitting your images because if I run out of images to edit, I'll have to come up with some of my own. And I think for demonstration purposes, um, I think you'll enjoy it more if you send your images and you can see what I do with your image. So use the form in the description below the video to submit your images and questions and I may get to your image next week. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for putting up with all of the, the um, technical issues today and the uh, audio and all this other stuff. So thanks for putting up with that and sticking around and hopefully a send your images and I will see you next week, hopefully without technical difficulties. Take care.